Hey everyone, today I'm joined by Dave Vicavetti Jr. His father was a capo in the Gambino crime family. His father worked with high-level guys like Albert Anastasia, Carlo Gambino, and many other people. Dave Jr. talks about his father and the crimes that he did. As a young kid, Dave Jr. got into some legal trouble himself. When he was 14 years old, he ran a tax scam, and it didn't end so well. In this interview, Dave talks about how he ran this scam and how he got away with it for so long. Another fun fact about Dave Jr., he was almost adopted by Frank Sinatra. That's a whole story in itself. Please subscribe to my channel if you want to get more interviews like this. And without further ado, let's get into Dave's story. You had to go through stuff in order to get to where you're at now. So what was, you know, growing up as a kid, you know, who was your dad? So my father was um, in about 15 books at the library. <laughs> and I used to go there and read about him. He was uh, uh, one of the um, members of the Gambino family originating uh, as the Anastasia family way back. Uh, my father had been a 17-year-old kid on the streets of Harlem uh, running crap games. And uh, Johnny Ravalato, an infamous uh, mob figure from back then, happened to come upon him and take an interest in him. And he took him under his wing. And the next thing you know, these guys are riding around with Lucky Luciano, Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky, Albert Anastasia, Carlo Gambino. And... Uh, and he was there throughout the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and eventually became one of the high-ranking members of that uh, organization. Uh, and that wasn't from me seeing it or hearing it from him. It was just facts that I found in newspaper and books and so forth about my dad. Um, my mother raised me and my little sister on her own because my father was in prison most of the time of my early youth. So it wasn't until I was about 14 that I really got to see him and spend time with him. And unfortunately, I was in trouble at that time. And he was coming out of prison and I was going behind bars. And it wasn't until later on when I was 16 and up that I really got to spend time around him. I got to work at his restaurant. Um, but I had his his father, got, thank God, my grandfather, Freddie Icavetti, uh, an incredible story of survival all his own. He came from uh, Brooklyn as a young kid and wound up taking the trains out west. Became a uh, boxer, a, um, what do you call those guys that, that ride a cattle, a cattle dude on the horseback. And, and <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I had quite an adventure uh, in the in the West back in the day. And then he came back to Brooklyn and, and had a, a family. And my father yeah. was one of four brothers. Damn. So well, I was going to go back a little bit. What did you, uh, you're going to prison when you're in 14? Yeah. Like the, I, uh, kids do. Like I said, I, I was reading about my father. So in books at the library, I was skipping school to do it. And mm -hmm. then I started acting on some of the things that these guys were doing back in the seventies and sixties. Um, I, you know, I had a guy who got credit cards out of the garbage can numbers for me. I paid him a dollar a piece. And back then, you could just order away on the telephone any type of things you could imagine. And um, they didn't check for authorizations on credit cards. They had a book of stolen credit cards and expired credit cards. So if the card looked good and it wasn't in that book, they sent it. So I ordered gold doubloons from treasure ships uh, uh, that were found off the Florida coast, uh, German Shepherd canine dog. Exotic birds, you name it. I, I was the first kid on my block with a full-fledged pinball game and an Atari game. The, the neighborhood neighborhood kids love me. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, you you had everything. Sounds like unlimited amounts of money. I mean, how, what well, would you have was, to do? What was the process with that? Did you have to call I them? Just up, I just pick up the phone, and I could always change my voice as a young man. I could sound older. I could sound like I had an accent. I could sound like a woman. And um, I would just pretend I was the person ordering it. And I ordered Omaha steaks every week. I'm sure. <laughs> the deluxe box, you know, <laughs> crab legs and all. I sent my mother uh, two dozen roses every week. Uh, uh, Did she know about it? or? I just told her that, that my father was helping me, which he had nothing to do with it, uh, <laughs> money. So, but, yeah, she was, she was a little suspicious, but she worked full time. Uh -huh. uh, so she wasn't around the house. I was. We were kind of latchkey kids when she was at work. Uh, but other than that, she was there. A great mom. Still have her today. 
I told her, Mom, I got to do an interview. Let's uh, keep it down over there with that rock music she plays. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool, man. That's what's up. No, I mean, that's cool, you know, that, you know, you went through all that, you know, and I guess, you know, you didn't really even know what you were doing at that age, you know, that I, it was something, you know, so such a big deal, a bad thing, you know, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, for you to think of that as a kid, you know, I mean, that's kind of a smart scheme if you think about it, but it's not. Well, that was just the beginning because with the credit cards, you know, it was hard to turn that into cash, cash. Yeah. I mean, I could turn it into possessions and jewelry and, you know, gold coins and so forth, which were pretty easy to move, obviously. I sold about three pounds of gold as a 14-year-old over the year that I was doing that. And then the next year after I got arrested, um, I sold it at $300 an ounce. And the next year it went to the highest ever at that time, $800 an ounce. Holy so God. I was kicking myself in the butt going, geez, how much money did I, I lose with that $500 difference on an ounce? Damn. Quite a bit. So, but so what I did is I branched out and became, um, I started impersonating an IRS agent collecting back taxes from people that didn't know them. And, um, and that really involved a lot more person on person type of contact with the, with the people. I would go to the bank, uh, you know, that would convince them they were dealing with an IRS office. And then I would send the office boy down to collect cash, which would save them off of their total bill with the government. So they were quick to settle for 2000, 5,000, 3000. So two or three times a week. I mean, I came in the first time and walked in my room and there was a ceiling fan and I threw $2,000 up in the air and a ceiling fan blew it all around. And, uh, and I remember that vividly, all that money. And my little sister opened the door and seen it. And she knew I was up to something. And she goes, I'm telling mom. So I snatched her in the room, shut the door. I said, hey, keep your mouth shut. I'll take you for some ice cream. Oh, and she's dude. like, forget that. I want a hundred dollar bill. <laughs> and she became my partner at eight years old. Oh All right. my <laughs> nah, she's about nine, ten years old, actually. I was 14, turning 15. So yeah, she was about nine or ten. Wow. So so you were just calling them and say, hey, uh, you owe this amount of money. You know, hey, if you just want, you can go meet the office boy in person. And yeah, you were actually widowers. So when I would call them, I could tell by the address of the phone book what part of town they lived in. And if they were on Collins Avenue in 68, that's high end, big money back then, especially. A um, lot of upper scale Italian, European, Jewish people, uh, even some Spanish people back then lived in that area that had money. And I would say, you know, um, whatever information I had from them, I would say, you know, so-and-so had a balance, da 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 and they would go, Harvey? And I go, yeah, Harvey, Harvey, uh, your ex-husband, God rest his soul, he, he left Owen in balance and you're going to have to pay it. And if they would scream for Harvey to come out of the bedroom, then I'd just hang up. And oh. back then, there was no caller ID or call trace. Well, I mean, the government could trace you. Um, example, one time I was on the phone calling from a pay phone and I was talking to the woman and it was at the Fountain Blue Hilton Hotel, which had a, a bank of pay phones. Uh, seven on that side, seven on this side. And I came in, I was making my call. There was a woman at the beginning of the hallway on the phone when I got there. And I guess at this point, they, they had brought in a task force from Atlanta, New York, um, Metro Dade, Miami, Miami Beach, to find this gang of people they thought were behind this thing. Because it went on for a while. That went on for a few months. Uh, I took in quite a bit of money from that. Uh, gave most of it back. Uh, when I was captured. Um, so they had a task force looking for this this gang. And I guess somehow they, had, I don't know how they did it, but anyway, they got on my phone call. Uh, but I was talking like a woman. So mm -hmm. as I was talking on the phone, I look up and I see three cops running this way. And I look down the hallway and there's like three security guards and another cop from the hotel coming this way. And there was nowhere to go. And I'm like, oh man, they got me. But they ran right past me and grabbed the poor woman. <laughs> and they dragged her off screaming and hollering. And that's when I knew, you know, they're on to me. You know, I said, let me just do like one more thing and then I'm done. And it's always the proverbial last time uh, that you get caught. And then I was caught. I was caught at the next time I did it. Well, um, how, what did that look like? 
you know what was going on with that. It's a movie. I'll be honest with you. It's a movie. One day, I definitely want to turn it into a film. Uh, kids will love it. Parents will maybe not like it as much. <laughs> Might put some bad ideas. In. Uh, but it'll well, be I definitely hilarious. If you think about it, though, I mean, you can't really a kid kid probably couldn't do that nowadays, anyways. So even if they tried, you think? I don't know. In the seventies, you could get away with even the eighties to a certain degree, uh, way more than you could ever today. I mean, let's right. face it; that put an end to organized crime. You mm -hmm. know, they know where you're at through your phone, and they hear everything you say. They yeah. know every text message. They don't even yeah. have to follow you around in cars anymore. They just put a tracker on your car and watch you from the office, whether you're drinking coffee you know so the, the days of um, illegal activity are pretty much coming to an end to a certain degree right you know, especially stuff like that you know for a kid to, you know if they watch it i mean they can probably try one time and they're going to get busted you know it's not going to be like you know how you were i would think you know how you got away with it three months. four years older five years older 20 years say i was 20 something uh, i would have been put away for Long for many, many years. But the yeah. fact that I was 14 years old and and it did start out as a prank in the beginning. I mean, I wasn't like it was a joke. You know, I was just feeling bored one day and said, let me let me pretend to be and send this lady to the bank. And then I go, wow, she's going to the bank tomorrow and she's going to take out 2000 in cash and there's not going to be nobody there. You know how funny. What a troll. Right. And then I was like, nah, I grabbed my sneakers, my two-piece leisure suit, I had a little bright leather briefcase, no briefcase, and I was there in the morning <laughs> waiting on the lady. I mean, no one was ever harmed. I never, you know, strong-armed anyone. It was always, you know, I walked into their taxis, you know, I was polite. And like I said, in the end, most of that money uh, was given back to the people. So what, what, what happened when you got busted then? Yeah, so I had this one lady, she was a writer like I am now, ironically, and she wrote uh, mysteries and fictions, and she said she didn't buy it for a minute. She acted like she did, uh, but it sounded like one of the stories from one of her books. Um, so she called Miami Beach Police, and they were waiting for that phone call. I mean, they had the whole task force there. Like I said, they were getting close. They didn't you know, know for sure who was what, but when that phone call came in, they... Um, they jumped on it. So I went to her bank the next day. I knew something wasn't right. She didn't act like any of them. She wasn't friendly at all. I mean, and leaving that bank on foot on Washington Avenue, I could just feel, you know, the juju wasn't good that day. And sure enough, I look over my shoulder. I could tell it was an undercover detective. He was following me. Guy looked like Tom Selleck. I mean, it was like straight out of a Hollywood casting. And I made it between these two buildings. There was a taxi cab there. I'm like, let me make it to that taxi cab. I'll toss the guy a hundred dollar bill. I'm out of here. And I didn't make it to the taxi cab. As I came out from the two buildings, this giant guy stuck a 45 automatic between my eyes, told me to hit the ground. And as I hit the ground, guys were running down the alleys with shotguns. A helicopter was flying over, cars screeching all over the place. They were stepping on my head, stepping on my hands, handcuffing me. And finally, the one of the guys go, get the cab driver, get the cab driver. And they yanked him out of the window, and he whips out a badge. He was an undercover cop. Jeez. So even if, I, even if I had made it to the taxi cab, I wouldn't get far. But what's funny about that is that the, at the police station, while they were interrogating me, two different detectives came up and showed me their names and said, kid, next time, this won't happen, you know. We'll work together on it, basically, is what they were saying. And even at 14, I wasn't stupid. I'm like, yeah, right. I'm going to call a detective and say, hey, I'm going to do this crime. <laughs> it's such and such a day. <laughs> Jeez, um, man. So, yeah. so well, what happened? That they booked you, and then what, what did, where'd they take you? They took me to Dade County Youth Hall, and they put me in there with the big boys, number unit seven, which is the big boy unit. And these are guys from from the worst parts of South Florida in the world, for that matter. I mean, these stone cold, you know, street guys from the 70s, Liberty City, you know, Wynwood, uh, Overtown. And they're like looking at me, you know, and they're like, we're going to have a lot of fun with you, Italian boy. Welcome oh, to the club. <laughs> and uh, I was sweating. I'll be honest. The first night I was there, I said, oh, man, I'm dead meat. Um, but then the newspaper came out the next day and I was on the front page of the newspaper and suddenly they were all my friends. 
They were telling me they had bags of money buried outside and different things. And they go, when we get out, we're going to do some stuff together. And (laughs) one of the things I remember to this day had nothing to do with me, but it'll make a great scene in one of the movie in that movie when it's done is I remember this vividly standing outside. Uh, Of course, we couldn't smoke cigarettes back then, but you could stand around at break time. They'd let you out. And they had these, I mean, 10 to 12 foot high fences. And it sits right on one of the main drags in in Dade County in Miami, uh, 27th Avenue. And once you get over 27th Avenue, once you cross it, deep in the hood, right? Deep in the hood. And there's this kid standing, kidding, about seven foot tall, black guy, standing there with a couple of other guys, a Spanish kid. And they're talking, and he's like saying something, and he starts handing all his stuff to the guy standing around him. He goes, yeah, I won't be needing none of this. He gives one guy a sandwich, gives his other guy an apple, and he goes, oh, you getting out? You getting out? He goes, yeah, I'm getting out. He goes, I thought you had no bond. He goes, yeah, I got no bond, but I'm getting out. And there was guards to the right and guards to the left of us. This boy took off across the court full bore. And he must have been a basketball champion, dude. He ran. He jumped. His first foot hit that fence, locked in one of them holes in it. Next yeah. foot was five feet higher, and he went right over that fence, man. Boy, holy Come, holy shit. Hung down, dropped, boom, and he was gone. And those guards, they didn't move three feet. They just leaned over and couldn't believe their eyes. And there was, boy, a whole, hauling ass right through the – I wish I could have done that, but my fat ass would have never made it halfway <laughs> up that bit. <laughs> so they never got him, did they? I mean, eventually they, they probably no, no. <laughs> no. never. But yeah, so I mean, it, you know, it's just funny looking back. But when you're sitting in there and you're a caged animal and you know you did wrong and why you're there, you know, it's uh, very depressing, and you either learn from it. Are you embrace it? And I wasn't about to embrace it. Some of those guys do, you know, they're right at home there, you know, being in behind bars is much better than being at the crib with, you know, whoever it is that makes them unhappy, you know, um, but, but not me. So I want to use those kind of stories and I have been using them to success so far in my written work and, and so forth. So I want to take it to the next level with film. A good friend of mine, um, Cyril DiPaggio from down here, he's had a lot of success doing original content. Um, he's had me in one of his, a couple of his projects with partners, one, one about my father, silent partners. Um, yeah. So what, how was that one? You know, with, you know, cause that was your father, you know, I mean, we were able to put some stories together that were about him and you know, what, 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 what did that kind of look like? Yeah. I mean, silent partners is available on Amazon. It's under fat Dave Gambino Capo. Mm-hmm. And it's more of a historical, documentation of some of the memories that I have of my dad and experiences I had and stories I knew of of my father and his friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to do a part two that will get, you know, more involved in it. Uh, but it's actually a, um, it's nonfiction. It's, it's, you know, true accounts of what I experienced and knew about. Whereas the TV show is a fictional series, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's based on fiction <laughs> and some other events that took place over that span of time. Uh, my second book is a work of fiction. It's called Dr. Minch. And um, that one is basically some guys from New York came to me. Uh, one of them was a psychiatrist. And he said, listen, we want a book about a psychiatrist that goes in criminally insane, becomes this master criminal, and no one knows but him. And Dr. Minch was born. So, um I can see him as a comic book character later on. He wears an old uh, mask from the plague days. And what's Mm -hmm. crazy is we wrote this before the pandemic even started. And then three, four months later, as the book was finished, the pandemic hit. So we just incorporated that right on into the book because it took place in 2020. So it's perfect. Perfect. Yeah, seriously. No, that that is that that goes along just just right with it, man. I mean, it's crazy how the timing goes, you know, I mean, and how you can adapt things into your, you know, work and whatever else it is. Sure. But, uh, you know, you you know, you were in jail and stuff. I mean, was that the last time you ended up going that after that you kind of changed around? You know, I changed my ways as far as criminally taking 
profit from it. But then I got involved with some bad guy kids and people and so forth. So I went to jail, not prison, a few quite a few times in my late teens and early twenties. But it was always for baloney stuff, man. Arguing, wrong place, wrong time. Mm-hmm. You know, um, friends of mine broke into a car at the Dolphin game, and I was there and didn't report them. I went down for it. Uh, just stupid kind of stuff. So. After a while, I realized, you know, I'm not going to hang around all these kind of people. I think one or two that were worth the risk that I really knew close friends and they're brothers of mine to this day, Ciro being one of them. My partner on Club TV, Mike, is another one. He has a fascinating story, too. Um, But, yeah, I've just learned that we're kind of masters of our own destiny to a certain degree. And, you know, when you're doing something you shouldn't be. And if you continue to do it, then that's on you. Uh, right. You know, insanity repeating the same thing over and 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 uh, getting the same result. So I try not to do that anymore. I try not to be stubborn and and listen to that little inner voice. Plus, I'm not a kid anymore. I'm not a spring chicken. Uh, <laughs> I definitely got to take it a little more easier than I have in my past because it's it's been quite a ride. But now I'm ready to coast for a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was it hard, you know, I mean, because you had, had had a strong mentality because, you know, your dad being who he was, you know, a, a capo in the mob family, you know, during was was he doing all that actively while you were growing up as a teenager still, too? You know, and you had to kind of yeah. steer away from that. You never leave that world. I mean, right. like once you're one of them, there's no leaving, it, you know, so you die. Whether you're in their good graces or not, if they help you along your way or, or whatever it may be, you're you're in it for life. Uh, my father and my mother both made sure, you know, I didn't go down that road. And uh, I'm more of a people person. I like people. I like helping people. I like talking with people. Um, for me to be successful in his world, I would have had to have been a very bad dude. I would have had to tap into a side of me that I only want to use in film, you know, or to protect loved ones in a crisis situation um, I don't enjoy, I wouldn't enjoy hurting people or, you know, those type of things. Not saying my father did, but you've got to have a, some kind of taste for being a cold son of a bitch right. to survive in that world for a minute, a day, yeah. a week, much less a lifetime. So, and he right from the gate told me, you know, kid, you write stories, you got ideas for movies, stay in that direction, <laughs> you know. And guys, yeah. I mean, I met him. I met some of the the biggest you can. I, mean, I sat across from Meyer Lansky at Wolfie's. Um, not because of my dad, actually, that was because of my mother. He used to come to a, a restaurant she worked at every week, two or three times a week for lunch. And one day he's sitting there with two of his guys, and right next to him is uh, Don King, the boxing promoter, with uh, uh, Ken Norton, and I believe it was Joe Frazier. I was like fourteen then, is right before I got arrested. Uh, so it's it's magical being around that world, mm-hmm. especially when your father is someone he's a high ranking guy. He's not just a you know a muscle guy or a medium level. I mean, he was one of the, the I think architects of that whole five family thing. I mean, he was there with Carla when it was the Anastasia family. So um, and Anastasia was a guy. He was a little bit crazy, I guess. I mean, he had no limits. And even those guys, it's not a matter of hurting people just to hurt them a lot of times. It's a matter of doing the right thing. So, and Anastasia, he didn't care if you became a threat or a nuisance. Gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <so laughs> they didn't play with none of that shit, man. So that's that's good that you were able to steer away from that, you know, and especially, like I said, with your father being who he was, you know, and with that title, you know what I mean? Because it could easily could have wrapped you in there, especially, you know, with the little scams and stuff that, you know, they could have, you know, thought, oh man, this, this is a kid smart. He's already picking up on all this, these scams and all this other shit. You know what I mean? Oh, I would have gone far. Had I chose yeah. to be in him. I have no doubt, but I, I would have been an Anastasia guy, you know, I would yeah. have been one. Of them. And, and I don't, you know, like I said, I don't mind playing one as an actor in a movie or, Something like that. But in reality, uh, like uh, I knew a couple of the guys that I would think were, 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 were the worst of the worst as far as when it came to um, no holds barred with their enemies. 
and they live that life every minute of the day. They don't care. You know, they don't care about life. They don't care. You know, I mean, they care a little bit, but they're not worried about it. They're not scared. Nothing intimidates them. And they're ready to go to blows and go right back to prison the next minute, if that's what it calls for. Um, I, I don't. I would much rather be outside taking care of loved ones or writing books or making movies than sitting behind bars being hard. You know, that's just not that's just not not me. And again, my dad made sure that, uh, you know, as much as he could, you know, yeah. you never get away from it. You know, I every day I turn a corner and there's someone that you would never believe from that world is suddenly right in my presence for some reason or another. Oh, I know you're dead. As a matter of fact, I went by Dave Cavetti for the longest time uh, so that people didn't connect me to my father, you know. Uh, matter of fact, I was in my dad's restaurant working for him. And even the people in the restaurant didn't know I was his son. And some of the dishwashers were hauling steaks and shrimp out the back from the freezer. And uh, they uh, said, yeah, Dave, come on, man, get some. And I'm like, nah, I'm okay. And they're like, why not, man? Help yourself. Nobody will know. And a little while later, my father walked in the back and he goes, all right, son, I'm leaving. I'll see you later. And they turned and looked at me and like, that's your father. <laughs> <laughs> the steaks and sea and shrimps showed back up mysteriously. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, right after that. <laughs> yeah. So but when did you get into he was it? Good. He was a, he he was an incredible guy, and both my parents are very incredible people. So I was very fortunate, and uh, I'm blessed. You know, I'm blessed to be in the entertainment business now, and. And use all those experience and those lessons learned and stories heard and so forth in an entertainment format, whether it be a TV show, a book, or a movie. Right. When did that uh, come about? You know, what was your first uh, step into the entertainment business? I was 16 years old, and I had an idea for a radio promotion. Uh -huh. And my mom went with me in Panama City Beach, Florida, actually. And um, we went down, the guy owned seven radio stations across the South. Uh, WPFM was the big rock and roll one. And, um, and I was on his, uh, his AM station. And the guy, the owner of the seven stations liked me for some reason. And he says to my mom, he goes, you must be the stage mom. And she's like, yeah, and smiled. And he goes, you know what? It was and the name that I had come up with was the radio station was 3WQ, WWWQ Radio, and 3WQ was the handle of the Night Stalker. And it was this guy with a mask and a hat and a cape and gloves. And he, they had a big Q van that had Coca Cola on top of it, a giant Coca Cola can. I didn't know how to drive a clutch. And they put me in this van in this costume, and I'm out there and I burned the clutch out the first oh. day. I Job. <laughs> so that should have got me fired, but it didn't. He, he stuck with me, and uh, and that became my first promotion. Mm -hmm. And then we came to Miami. We had moved back to Miami uh, from from the west coast of Florida, and um, I got uh, a job there with WKAT Radio. And then I got lucky. I got to be an extra on Scarface, Porky's, Absence of Malice. I met Paul Newman, Sally Field, Al Pacino. I met Frank Sinatra because of my dad when I was 14 at the Fountain Blue Hilton. It was like meeting God. You know, he had a diamond on his finger the size of a walnut. He came walking out of the back of the Fountain Blue. And, um, you know, I mean, once you meet Frank Sinatra, there is nobody that's going to impress you more after that. That's like, to me, was one of the <laughs> greatest achievements of my life was meeting him. He actually offered to adopt me when I was a kid at one point, but my mother wouldn't go for it. My dad wouldn't go for it. And so it didn't happen. Holy shit. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it is. How did it you is. feel about Think that? about how life might have been had I been adopted by him. Um, but then I look at his son. You know, his son got kidnapped. His son had a rough life. He died younger than me, actually, recently of a heart attack, Frank Sinatra Jr., so, you know, the, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. So um, it's nice for commentary, but I'm glad that, you know, I'm, I know who my parents are. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, how, how old were you when that would have even happened? I mean, a uh, tiny newborn. Oh, mm -hmm. newborn. oh, okay. So you wouldn't even know any different, you know, or have any. Yeah. And so. I asked my father that. I said, why didn't you let him adopt me? He goes, well, one, your mother wouldn't go for it. And two, you'd have never spoke to me again. 
And, you know, he's probably right because I wouldn't have known who he was. Yeah, you wouldn't have known any different. Yeah, you wouldn't have known. You know, that's just kind of how it would have been. But, you know, like you yeah. said, you went through what you went through and it got you to where you are now. And, I mean, that's cool as hell that you were in Scarface, you said, too. You're an extra. Yeah, you can see me for like one second. A friend of mine took a snapshot and Pacino's there at the pool with his pina colada. And I'm standing behind him with a big grin, Joker grin, and my shades on, my long 80s hair, um, my skinny ass back then at 18. I was pretty thin. Um, That's so cool. I'll get the picture for you, and I'll send it yeah. to you. Yeah, I'd love yeah. to see that. So that was one of your first ones that you were in, you know, when you were coming up? Porky's was the first one. Well, I've seen some animals, Porky's. Those two I did right together, and okay. I was so starstruck. Uh, Porky's, we didn't have a lot of stars on the movie at the time. They became stars, you know, later oh. uh, from that cast, a couple of them. Uh, yeah. But there was so much fun. I mean, God rest his soul, Bob Clark was the director. And every day he was like, well, if we don't get the money from the studio in Canada, we're shutting down. And so every day I'm thinking, damn, I'm going to be out of job, man. <laughs> and that's that, that's the movie business, even today sometimes, even with the big budgets, you don't know from one day to the next if it's going to ever reach the, the screen. But this one hit the screen. At uh, same time, a good friend of mine in the future to be was Joe Rubo. He was in The Last American Virgin. His movie came out and was a big hit around that time. And then we met through my father later and became really good friends. And he was one of the producers of Club TV uh, recently. And... Um, it's exciting, you know, it's exciting to see all of us still um, around working on these movies yeah. and making success all these years later. Yeah, so it did open up more doors, you know. I mean, you got to start somewhere, you know, but that's with anything, you know. And that's cool that you got to be a part of those because, you know, I mean, especially with the Scarface one, I mean, that one really blown up. And, you know, to be a part of something like that, that's incredible. And then that was just your beginning part, you know. I mean, you you stepped up and you kept going. Two, two weeks, weeks I was a fly on the wall making two hundred dollars a day. Um, mm -hmm. Movie, it was the greatest gig of my life, without a doubt. And at the Fountain Blue, normally you as an extra you eat off a chuck wagon, or you know it's catered or whatever. But at the Fountain Blue, which is one of the highest end places, even to this day, it's one of the places to go on Miami Beach. Um, for the extras, they brought out white glove tuxedo waiters. Damn. With silver praise and served us, and I was like, "Did I die and go to heaven?" You know. <laughs> and there's Al Pacino right there, right you know, right across from me. Um, so, uh, but he was in his Tony Montana mode, yeah. and um, you know, when you're in that method acting type of thing, um, you, you may not be as nice as you normally would be to people. But he was definitely in the Tony Montana. Uh, persona, but I'll tell you what I found interesting with Paul Newman. Uh, Paul Newman, Sidney Pollack, a very famous director from back in the day, he did Dress to Kill, He's famous in his own right. Sally Field, they were all making this movie called Absence of Malice on mm -hmm. Cuba's Game. And they had all these boats, and they were going in and out with these boats, and a baby manatee had wandered into the marina. And I saw it, and I went up to one of the crew, and I was telling them about it, and Paul Newman overheard. And they're protected species, even back then. And Paul Newman's like, wait a minute, show me. Show me where this manatee is. And I showed him. And they shut the entire production down on that movie set, oh, uh, which was talking fortune, obviously. Just Newman alone on there, you know what kind of numbers. And um, they shut the whole production down. And Paul Newman, Sidney Pollack, went out in a rowboat with a couple of the crew members and guided that baby uh, manatee back out into Biscayne Bay and saved it. Because it would have been cut up, it would have been cut up by propellers, and I remember thinking, "Wow, you know, that's really something that these guys care that much to do that." You know? Yeah, yeah, because they stopped everything. You know, I mean, that would have been they could have, you know, wrote that off as a total loss. You know, but luckily they they took the initiative and they ran in there and actually went in there themselves and got that out. I mean, that's lucky that's for the manatee for sure. Yeah, <laughs> like you said, because they could have got shredded up. <laughs> yeah, it's no fun, man. It's what happens to those poor things, you know. Um, but yeah, you know, and as I succeed and, and progress, I hope to help, you know, other people too in the process along the way. I think it's part of it. 
uh, is giving back. You know, a lot of people helped me over the years with, you know, advice and guidance and connections. And, and uh, I, I hope to do the same as I, uh, you know, finally bring home the big, you know, the big trophies. Yeah, no, that's good. You know, I mean, you really turned it around from, you know, where you started, you know, and where you're at now. I mean, that's incredible. You know, you really do have a, you know, interesting story. And I think, you know, like you said, that that scene where you uh, got arrested that one time, you know, I think that'd be a really good movie. I mean, do you ever plan on doing that? I mean, I do. I, do. I have a whole slate of films and books that I'm going to be releasing over the next couple of years. Okay. Uh, and now things have come in along financially so that I can actually spend more time doing the creative process on that. When you're on the hamster wheel trying to survive, which we all go through, uh, and we're born with a golden spoon, some of us maybe, uh, a lot of times the golden spoon is opportunities, and that's what God gave me plenty of. So I'm slowly learning how to, you know, make those happen the correct way and bring them home. But um, it's a good feeling to know. For example, when um, I was 14 and got in that trouble, there was a kid I used to ride the school bus with. He was a bully. I didn't like him. But, you know, he was a good looking kid. Everybody in school kind of liked him and gravitated to him. He wound up pulling off a burglary with his next door neighbor, an 80 year old lady on Miami Beach. She caught him and he just found her gun. And when she caught him, he shot her. Damn. And she kind of known him forever. They, he'd grown up right next door to her. And she's like, Ronnie, how could you do this? She was, give me a scotch. And he went over to her bar. He poured her a scotch. He took her to scotch. She drank it. She died. He took her money, her gun, and his friends. They went to Orlando, Disney World, had a blast, came back. Miami Beach cops were waiting for him. So in all the time I've been able to do these movies and have these businesses and work on these projects, uh, he was sitting in prison. He sat there, I believe, 40 years. And Holy finally they released him as a gray-haired man. But he was the same age as me. He made one mistake that I know we know of, a bad one indeed, you know. Um, but uh, he uh, he wasn't able to have that 40 years of um Freedom. Life like I was. So I feel very, very lucky. Plus, yeah. there was other kids that, you know, died from heart problems or accidents and so forth. Yeah. Uh, so every day above ground is a good one for sure. <laughs> <laughs> true, man. True. You know, and I mean, that's crazy. You know, I mean, one mistake, you know, like that, even, you know, completely being in the wrong, you know, it just really changes your life and you can be sitting in prison for the rest of it or a good chunk of your life, you know. So it's. <laughs> That's good that you uh, steered away from that, you know, like you said, I mean, and, you know, that's the plan with, you know, doing these kind of shows and, you know, talking to people like you, because, you know, hopefully it, uh, you know, steers people away from doing that kind of stuff and, you know, try to do something like you, like in the entertainment business, you know, or whatever. If we save one kid from going down that road, uh, then we've done some good, you know, yeah. with any interview or any, you know, advice or stories. And I think a lot of people, relate to stories from the past they don't always take the advice or the message but they listen <laughs> and that's yeah. a start you yeah. know so and i've yeah. learned you know i've learned to uh pay attention and learn you know from not only my lessons but other people's lessons like johnny depp right now <laughs> what he's going yeah. through <laughs> i don't ever want to go through that <laughs> yeah, no. But no, that's why I'm going to lose a finger, much less 50 million. You know hell what I mean? No. Hell no, man. But no, that's 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 what I'm saying. You know, I, I listen to the stories too, you know, because they have, like you, you have great advice, you know, great tips, you know, that, you know, someone else might not want to go through that or, you know, maybe might give out good tips for the entertainment business. You know, it's like they go hand in hand. You know what I mean? It's just a overall good thing. You know what I mean? That these, these do. You know what I mean? That's. That's what I'm trying to get out of him. You know what I mean? I extract yeah. all the good stuff. Speaking of Johnny Depp, he was, uh, he had just got the gig on uh, Jump Street back uh -huh. in the 80s. And there's a club. It's still here to this day. It's it's under a different name. They call it Cheetah now. But it was a uh, rock and roll mecca. And Johnny Depp was in there. All the bands of the day would come there. 38 special, you know, all the big guys when they were in town. And, um, and that was another thing that stirred me 
as I came into my late teens and early 20s, more into the entertainment business, because I remember looking at Johnny Depp and he's right down this piece from right down the street in Miramar, a few blocks from where that club was. And I'm thinking, man, if a local boy here can make it, <laughs> I got a chance, you know, yeah. <laughs> at that time, yeah. Ciro DiPaggio was there and some other guys uh, that went on to become quite successful in the music entertainment business. So, uh, yeah. Again, I think the universe pushes us in, in the direction and we either go with the flow or we don't. You know, sometimes we're just stubborn and don't listen. Uh, yeah. But I've tried to hear the messages in the in the breeze, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely know what you mean. I mean, you can either take it or leave it. You know, I mean, you, you're in charge. You're in charge of what you go through. You know, I mean, you, you get to make these decisions. You know, it's you take it or leave it, you know. Exactly. Uh, I'm, I was going to ask you a few questions. This is what I ask sure. everybody that comes on. You know, what is a, you know, a lesson that you've learned from a business where you may have been screwed out of a situation that you can prevent someone from going through? Well, I've learned in business, you can't trust anyone, anyone, family, friends. Um, like a director told me one time about movies. He goes, it goes on the stage. I mean, it goes on the page before mm -hmm. it goes on the stage. Right. So no matter who it is, get it in writing. You know, if there's trademarks involved or patents, patent them, trademark them. Never put off to tomorrow what you could do today. Because unfortunately, there's a lot of people that don't have the incorrect, you know, the, um, I want to say the intellect, the intelligence, the creativity to do these projects on their own. But they're quick to steal someone else's and pretend like it was theirs. And then go to their dying grave swearing it was theirs and they created it until you prove them wrong. So if you've got a song, you've got an idea, you've got a concept, uh, even for just a business, uh, as much as you want to share it, and, and, I, and I'm a big talker, as you can tell, uh, you have to keep your cards close to your vest and not really, you know, not really trust anyone or take any uh, additional chances that you may not have to with whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. Because sadly, a lot of people want to see you fail and it's really got nothing to do with you. It's for their own personal satisfaction for some twisted reason. And I gave up trying to understand that. I just know they're out there and I thank them for showing me what not to do. In the future. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's a good piece of advice, man. I like that, you know, that can help yes. some people, you know, even myself. Yeah, really. Uh, what, what motivates you uh, to do what you do every day? Again, you know, somebody asked me, said, Dave, you're always smiling. Why are you always smiling? And I go, because I know it could always be worse. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's so very so true. What, what motivates me is, for, is not to wind up in that worst situation, just to keep, you know, as far as I'm concerned, they really haven't seen anything yet. I'll be one of those guys that long after I'm dead, they'll be going, wow, you know, that guy did some stuff while he was here, you know. I may not get the recognition while I'm here, but at some point, um, I think uh, projects that I create while I am here uh, will go on without me. And yeah. that's fine. You know, leave a legacy for my daughter. And, you know, I have I have a daughter. I have a um, an adopted daughter, too. Two girls that I help raise uh, both up to um, um, certain points in their life. Uh, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to leave something for them to tell their kids about and be proud about. Yeah. I mean, it's true though. I mean, it's, it's sad, but you know, it's true with the, you know, usually the stuff that you did when you were here becomes more popular after you pass away. I mean, that's, it, I mean, it seems to always be the case, you know, so. Picasso, right? Wasn't he one? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just Don't get me wrong. I want to enjoy some of this while I'm here now. That's why I live every day in the fullest. Yeah. Uh, but I definitely want to, you know, create things that will last long after I'm gone. Right. Uh, okay. So one more for you. Uh, what would you tell your younger self, you know, if, if you can give any advice? Wow. That's a really good question because I would uh, have a long talk with him. <laughs> I would have a long talk with him. And no, number one would be don't lose your temper, you know, because losing my temper has been one of the biggest downfalls that I've had. I used to be very short fused, 
And now I'm a lot more patient and uh, I spend time with people that I love. And that, that would be the, the two things that I would, I would tell my younger self is take it easy. Don't get so upset so quickly. Enjoy life and spend that time with those that you love. Don't put it off for another day because they, you know, you may not be there. They may not be there. And if you truly love them in life, that's all we've got are those memories. I mean, we don't take none of it with us, right? Um, memories of put a smile on your face long after you're frozen solid in that morgue drawer. So, you know, make those memories. <laughs> make yeah. as many of them as you can. Have the biggest yeah. joking smile you can possibly have. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that's true, man, because you don't get time back, you know, so it's, it's why it's better with those who truly care about you and you truly care about as well, you know, because you don't get that time back, man. You don't. And, you know, only one guy's ever come back from death and and they crucified him. So. Right. So you don't want to, you know, there is no coming back. So while you're here, you know, make sure you got a checklist and check every one of those little things off that you possibly can smell that salt air, you know, eat an oyster, whatever it may be, uh, you know, embrace it. But yeah. I'm still going skydiving, bro. There's just something about jumping out of a plane. It's just a natural. Yeah. I'll leave the planet without doing that unless something happens while I'm flying somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no, I understand that, you know, cause I mean, I think that'd be really cool, but still, man, I'm still <laughs> that, you know, like I, I just don't think I trust it. <laughs> Not only that, something always happens with me. I always forget something. I'm clumsy. Uh, I, there was a guy on a construction site, and I guess that might be the reason I don't like parachuting is because he um, – we worked on the side of the building, and we would hang on in these harnesses, and we would screw these uh, – and it was on Panama City Beach up in the Gulf of Mexico in the wintertime. So, I mean, you're, you're being blown, and it's cold, and – these are, you know, 12-story high buildings, and I was with this one dude, and he's, and you have all these straps, and I'm not really meticulous about stuff like I should be, and uh, and we're strapping up, and he's strapping everything, and all of a sudden we go, and he goes first, and he went off and dropped like a rock, and he went down about eight stores, he, floors, he hit a roof. Um, I heard, I'm not sure. I think he was paralyzed for the rest of his life, unfortunately. But the problem was he forgot to strap the last strap, you know, it was the main that last, that last strap. And me, I could just see it now. You know, I'm in the plane. I jump and I forgot some stupid little thing and that's yeah. it. You know. <laughs> so Damn. I try to keep with things that I'm very versed in and I know about and aren't too dangerous because, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, exit any sooner than I have to. Yeah, no, no, especially after seeing some shit like that. That's got to mm. fuck with your head, you know what I mean? I mean, that'd yeah. be scary. Make you double, yeah, double think. Back for that guy. He's another one that's probably, or even if he was around after he uh, didn't have the quality of life, he could. And so one mistake, right? Just one yeah. mistake changed your whole life, whether it be criminal or not. So just think, think. Try to think instead of just acting, which I was more of an actor instead of. Now I do the reverse. Now I think a long time before I act. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's some advice I need to take, man, for sure. <laughs> you know, because, I mean, you can, like you said, shit happens like that, you know, and you just got to actually sit there and think, you know, instead of just, bam, some shit like that, you know, it makes you really think. It does. Life is quick. It comes at you quick, and sometimes it seems like it goes on forever, but in reality, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago it seems like yesterday for me. It's like, can it really be that long? You know, I feel that much that. time has passed, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, you got to enjoy what you're doing as much as you can. So, yeah. Oh, well, you know, uh, did you have anything else you wanted to add before we wrap it up, man? Oh, no, man. Just everybody check it out. I'm going to get to show you guys a lot of the stuff that was shot over the past 30 years. Uh, during my escapades with TV cameras under Club TV, it's going to be at Club TV dot M E Club TV dot me. Uh, July 1st, we go 24 seven as a 24 hour station and it'll be available worldwide. And you'll see Miami, Las Vegas, Europe, you name it. We've got videos and music from all over the world that we'll be uh, showcasing there. So that's going to be uh, pretty cool. 
Yeah, it'll have its own app. It'll have its own uh, um, database of clubs and places to go. And and you, like I said earlier in the interview, or maybe before we started, uh, you'll be able to see clubs that don't exist anymore that only we have at Club TV from when we shot yeah. there back in the day. So are some, of, are some of these still going to be like live too, like of today's day or are they from like all the past? Yeah, we're going to have live ones too. Matter of fact, yeah, the yeah. same time the channel kicks off, we're going to start taping new shows at different venues and doing lives and pay-per-view and performances uh, here That's in cool. Miami. And then by end of summer, Las Vegas, and then, you know, slowly but surely move out from there. Yeah. Um, but we've got over a thousand hours of footage from the past three decades of uh, nightclub. And, you know, Miami's like the nightclub mecca of the world. So, yeah. um, so it's no. going to be pretty exciting. I'm seeing footage now that I never saw 30 years ago. And I'm just like blown away. It's like, this is like a time machine. Yeah, that's so what gonna, you gotta feel yeah it's that like the TV part. when they first came out. Um, but a little better because we've got 30 years of, of, of a library to pull from, whereas they didn't. They just had music videos. Yeah, so. no, I, I really like the live stuff too, you know, because uh, I was in a pizza shop the other day and, you know, it's like, you know, I'm out here in Nebraska, you know, but it was like a Brooklyn one, you know, a pizza theme kind of deal. So I went in there and, you know, they had like New York or Brooklyn, just people live walking town, downtown Times Square and, you know, shit like that. It's just it's cool to watch and see, you know, it kind of gives you like, you know, if you're there, you know, it's more authentic or some shit, you know. I went on YouTube one time and I found Times because I've shot Times Square, Times Square three different times. I went to New York specifically to shoot Times Square. And one time as I'm coming into the city, just as it's getting dark, I shot the World Trade Center, the towers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah. was 2000. That was the year before they came down. So I have some awesome footage of the Twin Towers a year before they came down. But I looked up Times Square later on, and there's one from the 50s. Really? And I don't know what kind of camera they had, but some dude is walking down Times Square in 1957. He's walking by the pizza place. You see him throwing the dough. He's walking by the barber shop. They're cutting the hair. You see the cars, the streets, life. It's like wow. It's like you just went right into a time machine, and you're seven, seventy years yeah. ago. Wow, that's, how many? That's, that's almost 70, seventy years. Seventy something, yeah. yeah um, that's Damn, that's cool as hell. But Google that or look it up on YouTube, Times Square, 1957, I think it is, 55, 50 something, and, mm -hmm. and watch that five minute clip. It'll, it'll definitely give you chills down your back. It yeah, did I've me. Seen, anyway. I've seen one from like the 1900s, like the beginning, early 1900s. It's like, it says, uh, everybody in this video is dead now. <laughs> you know, it's just like, think about that. It's, that's the caption, you know, but it's, it's from the night, because, you know, 100 years ago. You know, it's just like, Jesus, man, that's it, like you said, it gives you chills. It's like creepy, you know, to think about think that. about it. We're in the 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 um, wild 20s all over again, 100 years later, the yeah. roaring 20s from the 1900s. Well, to me, it's like the roaring 20s of the 2000s. You know, it's going to be just as exciting. Yeah. And it's already started off with a different beat than normal. So let's see what happens by the end of the decade. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I heard that, man. But no, I really wanted to say thank you and I appreciate you taking out the time. You know, we spend about an hour today. You know, I really appreciate it. Awesome. You sharing your story, man. I mean, you really have an interesting story, you know, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. I wish you all the luck in the world. Anything I can do to help you out, let me know. And when you get to Miami, look me up and we'll party on set with Club TV. Hell yeah, man. Well, what did everyone think? Dave's got one hell of a story. His father was a capo in the Gambino crime family. There's not a lot known about Dave's father. He was a quiet guy. He wasn't flashy. He wasn't flamboyant. He kept to himself. He was one of the guys that died in their bed. Not a lot of mafia guys got that luxury. It just goes to show how wise of a criminal he was. Please comment any key takeaways that you got from this interview. Please share it with anyone that you think will enjoy it. Also, please don't forget to hit subscribe to my channel if you want to get more interviews like this. Also, if you want to find Dave's page about his club TV, I'll be sure to put that link in the video description. If you want to support me and my clothing brand, I got t-shirts, hoodies, beanies, and sweats all on my clothing brand website. 
I'll put that link in the video description as well. And at the end of this video, a Mafia playlist will pop up of all my other Mafia related interviews that I've done in the past. I've interviewed associates of the Mafia, made men, capos, and on the other side of it, law enforcement that infiltrated the Mafia and took them down. I've also interviewed lots of Mafia historians that have written books about the Mafia, and now quite a few sons and family members that were involved with the Mafia. One more thing that I'll bring up is my Mafia documentary series I've been working on. This documentary series has 11 episodes. Each episode is about a different crime family. In this series, I'm joined by capos, associates, made men, law enforcement, and mafia historians. Please check out this trailer to get a better understanding on what my documentary is about. Thank you again so much for watching. This life is very twisted. You never know when it's your time to go. One day you're putting in work with someone, and the next day they're taking you out. In our days, it was very quiet, you know, nobody ever talked about this, you know, nobody glamorized it. It was all like hush hush. It's not a glamorous life. And again, it's not what you see in Goodfellas. It's not what you see in Casino. Some days you were dead broke. Some days you had two grand in your pocket. It wasn't every day. You know, you don't know anything else. You don't know what it is to go wake up six o'clock and go to work. Work? What the fuck is that? I wasn't going to work. Even bosses get murdered in this life. There was younger guys underneath him, and he wasn't doing the right thing, I guess. He was coming out of the card game, and unfortunately, uh, a lone gunman came up and shot him five times. People who knew me would tell you, I like to use a bat a lot. If I had to shoot you, I'd shoot you too. I've done that. This life requires many mixed personalities. You have to wear many hats in this life to try and survive. You become four or five different people all at once, and... You got to go home and be a dad and a husband. You got to go to work and do your job. You got to be out in the street and be a gangster. The Bonanno family is called the Bonanno family because of my grandfather, Joe Bonanno. That life there is gone. Uh, today you have to be legitimate yeah, today. Man. But you're going to be an idiot to want right. to be a hooligan today. Because Jail time's now like 100 years for doing right. nothing. Yeah, you'll be dead in prison for life or in the witness protection program. I don't know anybody. Now, when the Mafia turned their back on me, I know everybody. There was the big flip of the Gambino underboss, Sammy the Bull Gravano. Here he is signing autographs in a restaurant on Mulberry Street. It was supposed to be a secret organization. He was a very, very, very violent guy. No question about it. Albert Anastasia, he was a Brooklyn guy. He was probably the biggest killer in the history of the mob. Michael Francis, his father, Sonny, uh, was a really tough guy, but he really raised his son right. Son, if you want to see a gangster, that's Sonny Francis. And John Cena, you don't compliment anybody. This is a documentary series about the American Mafia. It includes 11 different crime families. Each episode is about a different one. The crime families include the Gambino, Genovese, Bonanno, Colombo, Lucchese, the Gallo Crew, Chicago Outfit, the Philadelphia Mafia, the Patriarca, the Traficante Crime Family, and the Jewish Mafia. Please subscribe to my channel to watch each episode as they come out.